The Wild West is such a famous period in United States history for many reasons. Wagon trails, gold prospecting, ghost towns, and constant conflicts are all pure symbols of life on the western frontier. Most representative of the time period, however, are outlaws and the countless criminals plaguing the western frontier with violence and calamity at every turn. For the most part, wagon, caravan, train, nor horseback rider was safe in the open, untamed lands of the American West, often due to the high risk of running into cattle rustlers, banditos, and other slick outlaws staking their claim to fame, or rather infamy, on the vistas of the frontier. A good portion of the stories about desperados and the criminals of the Old West center on the male-dominated profession of being an outlaw. While it makes sense in regards to the culture and lifestyle of gender roles in the 19th century, it didn't mean there were no savvy women of the West making a name for themselves in the land of outlaws. As an effort to dive deeper into the lives of female criminals and the origins of their misdeeds, here is the first video in a series detailing infamous women of the Wild West who acted as outlaws in the heyday of scum and villainy on the Western frontier. Introducing Pearl Hart, better known as the Lady Bandit. Pearl Hart was born to two middle-class parents in a small lumbering village within Lindsay, Ontario on April 19, 1871, under the name of Lily Naomi Davy. Pearl was thrust into a horrible home life from the get-go. Her father, Albert Davy, was a severe alcoholic and violent domestic abuser, having been arrested and jailed for the attempted rape of a 14-year-old girl, and was thought to have been just as abusive with Pearl and her eight other siblings. Her mother, Anna Davy, was unfortunately unable to provide a safe life away from their despicable father. Without the ability to read or write, Anna couldn't work, and with an absentee father, it was up to the children to scrounge up enough cash to make a living. Thus, Pearl and her sisters turned to sex work at disturbingly young ages to make up the family's losses. It was through a connection Pearl made with a fellow sex worker in Buffalo, New York, that she first took the nickname Pearl, wanting to separate from her traumatic history as Lily Davy. These attitudes persisted into Pearl's adolescent years, where as a 17-year-old, she fell in love with a man by the name of Frederick Hart, rumored to be involved with the vices around town and was no less of a womanizing drunk gambler seen in the seediest edges of Lindsay, Ontario. It didn't take long before the unruly pair of lovers married. Their joy wasn't always apparent, however, as Pearl grew unhappy with her husband on various occasions, feeling like he was becoming more and more like her own father. As a result, Pearl would leave the family for undetermined lengths of time, while Mr. Hart was left to take care of himself, in and out of local pubs and card rooms. Despite Frederick's abusive tendencies, the couple remained together, going as far as to attend World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. The rifled couple spent a considerable amount of time on the fairgrounds, as Mr. Hart had been working as a carnival barker, and Pearl enjoyed wandering around, watching the shows and vaudeville performances dotting the midway. One such spectacle was Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show. Pearl was enamored with the depictions of cowboys and their unique, adventurous lifestyle. She especially fell in love with Annie Oakley and her bravado during her performances. Pearl dreamt up ideas of what it would be like had she participated in the Wild West's unfiltered history. At the same time, she was visiting the Women's Pavilion at the fair, where activists and poets came to read their work and inspire young women like Pearl. Both inspired by the shows and tired of her current hardships, she quickly made plans to leave her present life behind and flock westward to the potential of something greater. When the World's Columbian Exposition ended in October of 1893, Pearl set her plan into motion. She went home to Mr. Hart one final time to say her goodbyes and let him know this would be the last time she'd leave him, destined for things beyond the frontier. Afterwards, she went down to Great Central Station in downtown Chicago and bought a one-way train ticket headed for Trinidad, Colorado. Some accounts have reported that around this time, Pearl also formed a relationship with another man, this time a piano player in the carnival aptly named Dan Bandman. 
Her time in Colorado was short-lived, however. After discovering she was pregnant with her ex-husband's child while working as a singer in the nearby saloons, Pearl begrudgingly went back to her family in Canada, where she gave birth to a son. Of course, returning to a life with Frederick was unbearable for Pearl, and despite having a child to tend to, she asked her family, who had recently moved to Ohio, if they'd be willing to care for the boy. Pearl's family couldn't refuse, and before long, Pearl was once again set on a path for Phoenix, Arizona. Once Pearl arrived back in the Old West, or at least what was left of it, she took on various responsibilities to make a living. These jobs ranged from gigs as a cafe cook to a laundry attendant, but they never satisfied the young woman as the attraction of a life on the frontier began to wear off. By 1895, Frederick Hart was himself traveling around the Western territories in search of his estranged wife. He eventually found her in Phoenix and promised he was a changed man, ultimately winning her over and rekindling their relationship. For the first few years, Frederick proved himself worthy of a second chance becoming a highly successful hotel manager and bringing in a stable income to support the renewed family. However, the couple also spent a considerable amount of time with the vices, becoming quite familiar with morphine and liquor to an unsafe degree. With the increase of drug use and by proxy an increasingly violent Frederick, the couple's marriage once again fell apart. Pearl gave birth to another child, this time a baby girl, but it wasn't enough to salvage the relationship. Frederick had long told Pearl he wasn't cut out for the quiet life of being a working father that provided for his family. After a physical argument left Pearl beaten and battered, Frederick abandoned his wife and daughter and went away to Cuba to fight with the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, also known as Teddy Roosevelt's famous Rough Riders. By 1898, Pearl was left with nothing but her second child and not enough money to support her. Again, she traversed back across the country to Ohio where she asked her family to take care of her daughter in addition to the son that they had already adopted. Pearl simply wasn't cut out for the industrialized life making its way through the Midwest, and returned west for the final time in hopes to strike that initial flame of intrigue she felt during her past visits to Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Pearl Hart's next endeavor left her in the small mining town of Mammoth, Arizona, where Pearl struggled to make ends meet as a cook and local performer. Without motivation or direction, Pearl grew depressed and made attempts on her life multiple times. She would have died if not for the concern and compassion of the few friends she made in Arizona's mining camps. In 1899, it appeared all was lost for Pearl's Wild West dreams, until she made the acquaintance of a former miner turned outlaw called Joe Boot. Boot had put in a few mining claims around the Arizona desert, but gold was never found, and Boot was left penniless. After receiving a letter from home that her mother had fallen sick and couldn't pay her medical expenses, Pearl asked Boot for help, as he had been looking for quick cash himself. Boot, in turn, revealed to Pearl that he was planning a couple of train robberies at nearby junctions, and would bring Pearl into the operation for a cut of the earnings. All she had to do was pretend to seduce the single men aboard the train, bring them into their train car where Boot would be hiding, before popping out unannounced and knocking them unconscious, stealing whatever cash and currency was left in their victims' wallets. Unfortunately, as well thought out as the plan appeared, it brought in very little money, and it certainly wasn't enough for Pearl to send back home to her ailing mother, and thus the two hustlers turned their attention to stagecoach robbery. The stagecoach line they targeted ran between Florence and Globe, Arizona. They usually carried a driver, a shotgun messenger, and a few passengers. To prepare for the sting, Pearl cut off her hair and used Boots' clothing to disguise herself as an unsuspecting miner. They also were careful about which stagecoach line they selected. The Florence Globe connection made the most sense, as it was an older line that had hardly any history of recent robberies. As such, their target stagecoach was without its shotgun messenger, leaving the traveling party with one less measure of security. Then, on May 30th, 1899, the criminal couple sat at a hideout near Cane Springs Canyon, located 30 miles south of Globe. When the stagecoach passed through the canyon, 
Pearl and Boot jumped out in front of the horses and put a halt to its progress. Pearl, armed with her 38 caliber revolver, barked at the driver to stop. After scanning their surroundings to be sure the coast was clear, Boot then kept his own Colt 45 aimed at the driver, while Pearl moved around back to the passengers. Outside of the stagecoach, the passengers all coughed up their cash and valuables, including a gold watch and two of their guns. The haul brought in almost $450, nearly $15,000 in today's money. Of course, Pearl felt just a touch of remorse for the folks aboard the stagecoach, and before departing with Boot, handed back each passenger $1 for their cooperation. She then demanded the driver's own revolver be handed over before climbing atop their saddles and riding away into the distance. The driver of the stagecoach then waited until the outlaws were but specks on the horizon before unhitching one of his own stagecoach's horses and kicking it into high gear, blazing back towards Globe to alert the sheriff of the bandits on the run. Meanwhile, out in the Arizona desert, Pearl Hart and Joe Boot quickly learned of their grave mistake. The couple had spent so much time plotting out the robbery itself, they had forgotten to prepare for the escape portion of the sting, unsure of how to get to their next destination, a train depot located in Benson. The lack of preparation ended up biting Pearl and Boot. The two eventually got lost in the Arizona wilderness, running their broncos in circles and growing frustrated with the unmarked terrain. A few days into their failed escape, the pair of outlaws discovered a small thicket in the hillsides. Thinking the trees would provide both protection and camouflage, they stopped looking for the way out of town and set up camp. Unfortunately for the two of them, nobody put out the campfire before falling asleep, and the smoke kept rising into the clear Arizona sky well after dawn. As the sky turned bright blue and the gray smoke still hung in the air, Punnell County Sheriff William C. Truman and his posse of deputies spotted the smoke signal and rode to the campsite. When Pearl and Boot awoke that morning on June 5th, they were greeted by a flurry of pistols pointed in their faces, with commands to stand up ringing through their ears. Joe Boot was the first to rise, surrendering peacefully to arrest, while Pearl put up much more of a resistance, refusing to go down without a fight. Ultimately, the newly minted outlaw was subdued by Sheriff Truman, and the pairing was brought to the jailhouse in Globe, Arizona. After a few days, the couple was split up, with Joe Boot sent to a prison facility in Florence, whereas Pearl was shipped off to Tucson, despite the jailhouse offering no services specific to female inmates. Nevertheless, Pearl made the best of her imprisonment and became a local icon after word spread that a female outlaw, and a stagecoach robber at that, had arrived in the town. The nearby media outlets couldn't cover the story enough, which then drew the attention of reporters from around the United States. The proceeding frenzy was enough to turn Pearl Hart into the Wild West sensation she had always dreamt of becoming. She transformed into an Arizona celebrity, with quotes in the newspaper painting her as if she rivaled the West's biggest bandits. When she wasn't being interviewed, Pearl was visited by fascinated locals, who asked her for autographs and presented her with gifts, sometimes in the form of wild animal pups. Despite all of the smiles and show business on the outside, Pearl was still embracing her skills as a true outlaw, scheming for a way to get out of Tucson scotch-free. She grew close with a fellow prisoner named Ed Hogan, and together they plotted an escape. On October 12, 1899, Pearl finished digging out an 18-inch hole in one of the jailhouse walls and made her great escape. It almost worked in the long term, too, until a few days later she was tracked down by another posse of lawmen and returned to the Tucson prison. After a few more weeks of waiting, Pearl was eventually brought to trial in Florence, Arizona in November 1899. She knew how to work the jury, too, first by pointing out it was unfair a woman was being tried for breaking the laws written solely by men then by tugging the jury's heartstrings by saying the only reason she robbed the stagecoach was to provide for her sick mother. Pearl's lawyer lent an assist as well, arguing to the court that Pearl was a first-time offender and had followed the law up until this point, despite both of them knowing this wasn't exactly the case. After the trial, Pearl's sympathetic efforts worked in her favor, as the jury found her not guilty and acquitted her of the robbery. The judge assigned to the case, Judge Fletcher Doan, was incensed by the finding, 
and reprimanded the jury for acquitting someone who was obviously guilty. Not without options, Judge Doan alerted the authorities of the situation, and before long, both Pearl and Joe Boot were arrested again, this time on more specific charges of unlawfully carrying a firearm and tampering with a United States mail. The second trial came much harder for the two outlaws, as Pearl's impassioned yet calculated pleas did little to influence the emotions of a newly picked jury. Joe Boot was found guilty and sentenced to 30 years in prison, while Pearl received a much softer sentencing of five years. Both outlaws were sent to the Yuma Territorial Prison, a hellish discordant detention center on the banks of the Colorado River, where they were split up once and for all. Joe Boot found prison work as a supply wagon driver, delivering materials to chain gangs located outside of the confines of the prison. Boot couldn't let the opportunity go to waste either, and escaped from Yuma after serving just two years of his sentence. He reportedly abandoned his supply wagon and made off on foot, most likely to Mexico, where he was never seen nor heard from again. Pearl was also sent to Yuma, and wasted no time in regaining her celebrity status that she received back in Tucson. Being the only female inmate at the prison, she quickly garnered specialty status, an attitude not only shared by fellow prisoners, but by the warden himself. While various accounts differ on the exact relationship the warden had with Pearl, some stating the two were involved romantically, it was debatable that the warden capitalized on Pearl's fame while making sure she was comfortable at Yuma. He went as far as to provide her an entire 8 by 10 feet cell to herself, one that overlooked the mountainsides and featured a yard where Pearl could conduct interviews and photo shoots. It was here Pearl added a claim to her legacy, using her favor with guards and trustees to acquire goods and services that made her time tolerable at best. Unfortunately, Pearl's time at Yuma wasn't all sunshine and roses like the legend may lead you to believe. Pearl struggled as the only woman in the building, and realized behind bars that the outlaw life wouldn't be feasible if and when she broke free of her sentence. On the 19th of December, 1902, just three years after her trial in Florence, Pearl Hart was granted a pardon by then Arizona Governor Alexander Brody. Some attribute this to her good behavior and appeal to the public, while others say it was due to a secret relationship with the warden. The truth was that a smallpox outbreak at Yuma forced the hand of the prison's administration. Of course, Pearl wasn't without merit, as she had spent the better part of the last few years learning to read and write poetry, mastering the work of a seamstress, and finally beating her morphine addiction. In the end, it didn't matter, as Pearl had no qualms with her release and happily accepted the one-way train ticket she received for Kansas City, Missouri. In Kansas City, Pearl reconnected with one of her sisters, with whom she shared all of her Wild West stories. Her sister was enthralled by Pearl's misadventures, and together they wrote a stage production depicting Pearl's life on the frontier as the official Lady Bandit. The vaudeville-like show succeeded, but only for a brief moment in time. Pearl found her fame running on fumes after a few months in Kansas City, and eventually had to shut down the Lady Bandit production as expenses piled up beyond the profits. After her infamy as Lady Bandit fell by the wayside, Pearl attempted to capitalize on her stories about the Yuma Territorial Prison and the horrors she experienced as an inmate. Nobody really picked up on the fanfare, however, and again Pearl was left without much direction or set plan in place. For a few months, Pearl attempted to reignite her passions and former glory by working for Buffalo Bill's Wild West show itself, changing her name to avoid any fallback or curiosity from the law. This endeavor didn't really last long though, as Pearl had truly lost the luster for the antics of the frontier. That is, until a couple of years later, when Pearl once again wound up back in the Kansas City headlines. This time, it was under the alias of Mrs. L. P. Keel, after she was arrested for buying a can of stolen goods. After her petty theft was resolved behind closed doors, Pearl's footprints disappeared from the public's eye. Many accounts are unsure exactly what happened to the former female outlaw, besides the fact that she operated a Kansas City cigar store through the mid-1920s, hearkening back to her days with Frederick Hart and Phoenix. 
Other accounts believe Pearl died shortly after her second arrest in 1904, while others say she returned to Florence, Arizona in 1924 to check out the very courthouse she was tried in 25 years prior. Depending on who you ask, there are folks who believe Pearl Hart ended up in San Francisco, dying from unknown causes in 1952. Other folks suggest she died in the mid-1950s in Dripping Springs, Arizona, where she had married a farmer and taken the name Pearl Bywater. While the truth may never be confirmed, one author suggests most of what we know about Pearl Hart after her infamous stagecoach robbery isn't true, and that she died in Los Angeles, California in the 1930s under her married name, Lily Naomi Myers. Regardless of her end-of-life exploits and the gritty details emphasized by storytellers in the years since, one thing is for sure. Pearl Hart led a life incredibly uncommon to the rest of the Western frontier. There's a reason you don't hear about many female gunfighters or frontiersmen from the Wild West. Most were beholden to gender norms of the times, strict lifestyles that Pearl wanted no part of. She was a trailblazer in the way of feminine outlaws, and would end up being the only woman to survive a stagecoach robbery, and only the second to even attempt it, following the death of Jane Kirkham in Buena Vista, Colorado in March of 1879. You wouldn't have to go far in the Old West to find a saloon packed with bandits and questionable characters, smoking and swearing and drinking to their heart's content, sharing stories and reliving memories of stick-ups, jailbreaks, and thunderous rides across the open deserts. What you would have to go far to find is a woman who broke societal norms and lived the life once thought to only be available in folklore and mythology. That woman was Lily Naomi Davy, better known as Pearl Hart, Lady Bandit and Queen of the Outlaws, a legend of the Wild West and an unconventional icon. <laughs>